In this video, I'm going to walk you through the chilling case of Sabrina Zunich. What you just heard was the chilling cry of 13-year-old Megan witnessing a horror no child should ever see. Her sister, Sabrina, stabbed their mother, Lisa Kneffel, over 200 times. And as the officers apprehended, interrogated, and charged her with murder, one question still remained. Why did she do it? To understand whether it was intentional or manipulation, we're taking you through the case of Sabrina Zunich and what caused her to stage such a massacre in her foster home. Meet Sabrina Zunich, a poor child raised in a house where both parents struggled with drug and alcohol addiction. After being in the care of her grandmother for years, she was sent to the Emma Cayley Receiving Home at age 14. The next few years went by with her being moved in and out of the foster care system with no loving family to call her own. That was until July of 2011, when she was placed in the care of Kevin and Lisa Knafel. Initially, Sabrina blended well with them and their two daughters, Megan and Haley. But just a few months later, Zunich started acting out and fought with Lisa because she gave preferential treatment to her own daughters. Even though Kevin sided with Sabrina, she still felt left out of the family, even though she was not doing anything that would upset a parent. She was getting along with the sisters and doing great in school. But there was something about the share of love at home that just caused Sabrina to snap. In the early morning of November 16th, 2012, the Willoughby Hills 911 dispatch received a chilling call from 13 year old Megan. 911, what is your emergency? What is going on? Hello? Who has the knife? My sister. Where is your sister? Quick, quick, quick! Well, I got everyone coming to you, honey. Where is your sister? As the cops rushed to the scene, they found Zunich with a bloody 15-inch knife still in her hand. And in the master bedroom was the dead body of Lisa. The reason why Sabrina didn't flee the scene and just stayed there is because during the attack, Sabrina suffered several stab wounds and was in a state of shock. After she was taken to the hospital to treat her wounds, she was brought into the interrogation room just 10 hours after the murder. Sabrina was 17 at the time, so she should have had a parent or guardian present during the interrogation. But, according to the Ohio Revised Code, Section 2152.2, a 17-year-old can be tried as an adult if it's a serious offense, such as aggravated murder, which was the case here. For me, please. You, know, you remember me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm Jim Vitale, I'm a policeman. This is uh, Detective Parmer, Detective Broadwater, they yeah. work with me. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, we're going to sit down and talk for a moment. I asked them to come with me because we all kind of been working a little bit. Um, they're probably wondering what happened, and we're, we're wondering what, what happened here. We have some routine paperwork we have to go over real quick. Um, partner's going to explain that to you. <coughs> we, well, we ask you any questions, okay? We gotta give you, your, you know, some rights, okay? And uh, what I'm gonna do is when I when we give you these rights, I was gonna ask you the initials next to these rights, okay? Um, It'll be fine. In the interview, then. Even if you kind of kind of hold it like this and kind of do it like that, okay? Um, <coughs> just so you know, you are being uh, suspected of being involved in a homicide. So, do you want anything to drink? Yes. What would you like? Uh, uh, water? Water or some kind of a soft drink or what? Water would be fine. I'm sorry? Water would be fine. Water's okay? Okay. So what, uh, what do you, uh, what do you recall? Yesterday? Mm-hmm. Can I dump my homework? Getting, I don't know, and that's it. Mm -hmm. How about your bed? And we're at home? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would anything unusual happen? I don't know. Everything went fine according to what I know of. Mm-hmm. What, what happened? 
starting from? Starting from when you got home from school yesterday. <coughs> Notice her posture and immediate reaction to the door slamming sound. This is because she's still in a state of shock and is on medications. Even though she consented to answering questions, there's a possibility that the detectives might not get any. I got home, I went to my home. Then we had hamburger helper. And then I went back to doing my homework. Stayed doing my homework for like one. I went upstairs, no, it was like 12. I went upstairs, just tried to go to sleep. I couldn't go to sleep, so I went to go get some Advil. Mm -hmm. I have a girlfriend. Because my head hurts, because I have really bad headaches. I don't know they feel like. And after that. Where, I, where, where did you take um, ibuprofen from? In my son, Kevin's bathroom. That's where, where it's held. Kevin and Lisa's bedroom. That's where it's held. Kevin and Lisa's bedroom? Okay. Um, where Where is it at? Is it actually in a medicine cabinet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it on the first shelf, the second shelf, the third shelf? Do you recall? I believe that there's only two shelves. Okay. On the bottom. On the bottom shelf? So you went, you went in her bed, is there a bathroom in her bedroom? Mm hmm It's connected. Mm hmm Was uh, Lisa still awake? I don't, I don't know. I just remember going in there. Having the bottle, starting to shake it to get the meds, and then it's gone from there. Thank you. Okay. Do you remember what the what the bottle said? Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen. Wait, there was orange. Okay. Are you are you allowed in the bathroom? Only um to get Advil or something like that. Uh -huh. I call it up. I'll throw it every Other than that, no, not unless they're there or. You know, we're told to. So oh, what yes. would Lisa say to you then, when she saw you in there? I don't know. I don't know if Lisa... Did you get No. I don't remember anything at that point on. What do you remember? Everything except... Were you taking any little illegal narcotics yesterday? No. I don't do drugs. You don't do drugs? Almost last time you did drugs? Three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago? Okay. Um... You have not had any, any illegal drugs since then? Okay. Um, you were at home all, all night yesterday? Okay. Um, after you ate dinner, did you, uh, uh, did you have this opportunity to say goodbye to Kevin? I was at the computer desk. You were at the computer desk? No, no. I went to the living room also because I was printing my bridge slip. I don't know. I mean, I was in the living room, I was in the kitchen, and I was in the Excuse me. I mean, I believe so, yeah, he just said bye, because he always says bye to everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. We either say bye, chibala, feel like this is him. Well. Okay. You had an argument or anything with Lisa last night? No. No? Everything was fine. Everything was fine. Okay. Have you had these type of issues in the past where you just don't remember things? I, I don't, I'm not positive. I mean, I know I was in my other group homes. When I was in a fight with other people, I blacked out. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it. Have you ever been checked? What do you mean? Like, like have you medically? Yeah. Yeah, I go to a Okay, and you take, um... Vivian for a month Okay, mm -hmm. and what are those meds for? You have a Vivance is for ADHD, and okay. oxygen is for a mood stabilizer, slash anxiety. So it kind of stabilizes your moods? Mm -hmm. Okay. According to a later interview, Zunich revealed that she was diagnosed with ADHD when she was four and also suffered from oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. Now, while most of these do contribute to memory loss, it is still not enough to justify that Zunich doesn't remember what happened last night. What, what do you think happened to your hands? I don't know. I'm just saying that I'm being charged with homicide. Well, I'm investigating that. Do you remember blood being all over you? No, but I can see it all over my legs. 
there's blood all over your face or blood all over your body that's why you're not in your clothes do you remember your clothes I'm pretty the sure you do. yeah and then remember what you were doing prior to getting to the ambulance no in Lisa's room getting mad my headache that's why I don't get it mm -hmm. Was Haley there? When you were getting the meds? Mm -hmm. Was Haley in her room with uh, Lisa sleeping? No. She was not? No, he has her old room on the other okay. side of the house. Do you know what time Haley went to bed? I don't. She's usually up and down. I think around 11. Okay. She usually is passed out by the moment. Ow. Do you agree to working on your project? Are you working on a laptop or something there? That project for, for school? British literature. For what? British literature. Okay. Uh, what about Megan? She's always in bed. Okay. By the time I get upstairs. Alright, so she was up in her upstairs sleeping? Yeah, we were both upstairs in our rooms. We had separate rooms. Okay. So what happened after uh, after she went to bed? Um, is Lisa still still awake or is Lisa sleeping at this time while you're finishing your project? When after after Haley goes to bed and after Megan goes to bed? I, I don't know. I have my earphones on the whole time. I don't know if she's... What are you listening to? Music. Yeah. On, on what? Well, that's it. I don't know if you're listening to. At this point, it's evident that she's faking loss of memory because she remembers everything about everyone else, but when it comes to her own mess, she's blank. Perhaps a more sinister reason for this is that she's trying to appear insane. When criminals have to fake insanity, they introduce memory loss as a way to avoid discussing certain topics. In this case, anything that happened last night is worth forgetting for Zunich. The officers still need an opening, hence, they pick to discuss the one family member Zunich is closest to, her foster father, Kevin. How, how do you get along with Kevin? Kevin and me are cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's more the one that helps me out, mm -hmm. because this is Megan to deal with. Megan has in, in mental instabilities herself. Okay. And so we made agreements a long time ago that if I need anything, that I could go to Kevin. Mm -hmm. And if it was major that she needed to be involved in, then he would ask, but not to be concerned about small things. Because mm -hmm. it's already stretching her out. Is it her job and Haley? How about um, with Lisa? How do you deal with her? Me and Lisa have never been the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never tried to hurt her, never had any thoughts of hurting her. Yeah, it's been emotional and mental abuse from her to me. Mm -hmm. She put her hands on me, not fighting, mm -hmm. but restraining me so I wouldn't give an iPod to her. And I don't know. I, I don't know. She never seemed to like me, and she's been wanting me out of the house. Mm -hmm. Kevin was the only person Sabrina claimed she could go to when she had trouble, especially at the time when Lisa was giving preferential treatment to her daughters. So now they decide to bring up the elephant in the room as a way to jog her memory. What's your thoughts on how Lisa is not alive now? What? What is your What is your thoughts on that? That she is not alive? I, I, maybe you didn't understand. That's That's what we're talking to you about. She is me. Mhm. She's dead. You said it told me I did it. Yes. I, I, most of that blood was probably hers. That's why we need you to concentrate and think about what happened. There's always two sides to every story. And we want to know what you had to say about it. And we know you were there. You know, there were officers that got to the house after the, you know, they were called. So, we just need you to focus on what happened. You know you got, you were doing homework, and you know you got yourself to the bedroom to get the medicine. What you need to do now is bring it all together and think real hard about maybe what happened next. And then that'll explain how you got some wounds to your hands. Okay? 
What's gonna happen to Higgity Miggity Coven? Hmm? What's gonna happen to Higgity Miggity Coven? Healy, Megan, and Kevin are all safe. They're they're at home at right now. Haley's with Judy. All right. And Megan's with their dead. And Kevin's with Judy also. Anything coming back? Mm. Recall coming out of the bedroom with a knife in your hand? No. Well, it's, you, know, you had a knife. And you stabbed Lisa. I did. Yes, you did. And, and, and Megan called the police. That can't be true. Bree, it is. I'm sorry. Zunich's reaction to the news says a lot about whether she's faking insanity or not. She's faking ignorance to the death, knowing full well that she stabbed her nearly 200 times. You don't stab someone 200 times and not remember, let alone wonder if they're dead or not. What she's trying to do, through reduced emotional expression and disorganized thinking, is portray the events of November 12th as a psychotic episode. But the detectives can see through this and continue to put her in the limelight. I've never been a murderer. Mm -hmm. we, we need to know, that's why we're asking you to, to, to think about it. We need to know how to help you, okay? And we don't know that until we know, we, we need to get some facts and find out what's going on. And that will give us the best course on how, how to proceed from here and help you, help the family. And, and go on from there. What do you want me to say? I don't. Just we don't truth. want you to say anything except the truth, and we just want you to think about it because something happened by the time you were getting your meds in the bathroom there for your headache, and then and then all then one of our police officers arriving. So something happened in between that time, and we're just trying to get to the to the truth of that and find out what happened. I don't know. This is really bad. The man's dead. Sorry. Bobby's last name. 
I don't know. You, do you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. How do you know? Skating. I'm skating? You know, just skates. You go to school with him? No. No? How old is he? 15 or 16. Okay, so a little younger than you? Yeah. Okay. I'm usually just helping him give mental instability. Like, mm -hmm. just give it to the detectives pick pieces of what happened last night and place them right in front of her. But to all those points, she just says, I don't know. The detective again shifts gears and asks about the iPad and her friend, which she remembers just fine. There has to be a way to end her drama or an underlying reason why she's keeping up with this charade. The detectives now remind her of her foster sister who was an eyewitness to the entire massacre. But even that's not worth anything to Zunich. Have you ever punched any holes in your wall? Mm -hmm. your, well, have you ever slammed your door open where the door handle? Those were both there for Megan. They're before from Megan? I got there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. She has huge major issues with anger. Okay. She's pulled up on me multiple times and hit me, and then claimed that I tried to stab her with a butter knife. Mm -hmm. And. And you can ask Laura, which is Lisa's sister, and Kevin. We were all there when they went to training. Mm -hmm. She made a big deal out of nothing. Because she got mad about Laura not wanting her waffles, and I was buttering mine. She goes to hit me on my arm, and I go to restrain her hands because she wasn't going to hit me more. Mm -hmm. I had a button at my hand, didn't have time to put it down, but it was space. Oh, it's the floor. She's trying to struggle to get her hands away from mine. By the time I have it, the knife is in between our two hands. Mm -hmm. And they claim that I tried to kill her. She's also claimed that Kevin... While that is believable, there's no proof that this event happened. But to us, this seems like a foiled attempt at discrediting her sister. Even so, the detective realizes that she's sticking to her memory loss story and is not ready to open up. But, even so, the detectives have more than enough to charge her with first-degree aggravated murder. But as Zunich went through this painstaking process towards prison, not many focused on the man with the alibi, her foster father, Kevin. When Zunich was getting interrogated, he had arrived home, and according to the authorities, seemed calm and seemed more curious about the attack than disturbed by it. When she was booked into the Lake County Jail, he went to visit her, but got irritated when he was told that he couldn't. Around the spring of 2013, Zunich sat in jail, and Kevin collected his dead wife's insurance money, paid off his home, bought cars and a house in Florida, and even took flying lessons. For someone who lost his wife in such a gruesome way, Kevin doesn't seem remorseful at all. That is because he was already planning to part ways with Lisa before this incident. At this point, the detectives tried to make a connection with Kevin and the killing, so they brought him in to ask questions. Considering that Kevin walked in with his lawyer, they told him that they'd ask about his wife's work. Kevin, do you know anything that was happening at the house the night before you left for work that night? Well, let's, let's, hang on a sec. We just talked about talking about his wife's work. What's going on at the house the night before is not his wife's work. Okay. Where does your wife work at? Kind of county children's family services. What does she do there? She was a social worker for the um, children's section. Were you and uh, Lisa in the process of going through a divorce? Okay, now we're getting outside the... Uh, no matter how much they'd try to redirect the questioning towards the event, the lawyer would butt in and stop them. But even in the basic line of questioning, the detectives noticed that he kept looking down and didn't make eye contact. It was almost impossible to get him to crack at this point, but nearly six months after the murder, there came a breakthrough. Zunich agreed to talk to a prosecutor through a process called a proffer. In simple terms, Zunich is willing to confess the intent of the murder to a prosecutor and be 100% honest. This is the first step taken before entering a plea agreement. And while we don't have the complete proffer discussion, we have more than enough to understand the shocking truth. This is Kevin Knafel, my foster father. It was Kevin's idea, and it was talked about after we were having sexual relations and him and Lisa were having problems in marriage. 
he wanted to get a divorce, but Haley, which is a three-year-old daughter of his and her, was in the picture, and he wanted full custody. She would get custody, or it would be shared, and he didn't want that happening. So the alternative was for this to happen. When was it after you started to live there on a daily basis that your relationship with Kevin changed? When did the sexual nature start to change? Um, it all started not with sex but with massages because he was a truck driver and his legs would cramp so it was inner thigh then it progressively got into sex does he ever tell you hey you can't tell anybody about this all the time did you say what would happen if you told then you'd be taken out of my care and i could lose my foster parent license what did you say in response to that i would never do that okay tell on him Kevin was the mastermind behind this. He convinced her that after the killing, she'd only do two to three years, and during those years, Kevin would visit and keep tabs on her. But after his absence of six months, she decided to break the silence and reveal what a monstrous foster father he was. And it wasn't just her word against him. Turns out there were more than 1,500 messages exchanged between the two, most of which were awfully sexual in nature. On June 11, 2014, Kevin Knafel was found guilty on all 11 counts. Six counts of sexual battery, three counts of complicity to commit aggravated murder, and two counts of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2013. Zunich was also given the same sentence because the proffer granted her parole for 30 years.